So a few things we're just going to touch on. Uh, we're going to do a brief intro as to what WebRTC actually is, how it all works, taking the platform that's been created for the web and adapting it to our native platforms, some tools and resources that might be useful in building cross-platform WebRTC applications, and then we'll also look at some code and run an actual demo. So you might actually get to see my pretty face. Some resources before we get started. Uh, I have some of the source code up there for what we're actually going to be looking at up on my GitHub. I also wanted to leave links here for the WebRTC documentation, IceLink uh, documentation, which is a library we'll be using built by Frozen Mountain, and then some of the actual native libraries that WebRTC's community has built for Android and iOS APIs. And so, I want to, before you get started, because it's a common yeah. question, I want to point out that all of these materials will be made available after the uh, the guest lecture. So if anybody wants those links and everything, you'll be able to get them later as well. Yep. Yeah. Right. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay. So what exactly is WebRTC? So the acronym is for Web Real-Time Communications. Uh, it's a new-ish. Uh, it's been being built for a few years, but it's newish in the sense that it's becoming more of an actual standard around um, streaming, but it's an open source standard for transmitting data from one peer to another. Uh, so that data can be audio buffers, video frames, any sort of raw messaging data, or full files that are being sent back and forth. The most common is, um, as you would imagine, and what we're going to show today, being audio and video transmitting and, and building conferencing applications. Uh, similar to what we're actually using to demonstrate this uh, through GoToWebinar. So the data is transmitted over direct peer-to-peer -peer connections, so it doesn't have to go through server processing. Uh, it just sends data from one of client, whether it's a browser, a mobile app, um, or a desktop application, over to another client that could be any of those applications. So some important components and terms, um, and please stop me here if you have any questions about these because we might get into some weird acronyms. The first and the most important is the peer connection. So that's the, the general term made for when two clients are directly connected to each other. The second is an acronym called STUN. Um, I don't know how they fit this into four letters when there's like 30 words, but it stands for the Session Traversal of User Datagram Protocol, otherwise known as UDP, through Network Address Translators. So it's basically the means of communicating through a firewall and getting information back on the actual, about the actual computer or client um, connection information that can then be sent to another client to tell that client how to actually connect to that, that computer. So you can see in our diagram, the computer sends a request through its actual gateway to a server. The server then can process information and hit it against the gateway and the computer to get connection information. And then it sends that back to the computer. The next one is turn, and that's traversal using relays around NAT. So the idea of turn is that if you can't make a direct connection using just stun, so that data that our stun server sends you is not good enough for you to make a connection between two peers, that can mean you either have two different uh, network address translator types uh, or NAT types that don't work well together. Uh, maybe you have a really robust firewall or just two different firewalls that can't communicate uh, between each other. Then you you uh, turn to turn, which then allows you to make a relay connection to a separate server. So it's no longer a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection like we saw in this first little diagram. You actually connect via uh, an external server. The next one is ICE, or Interactive Connectivity Establishment. And basically, it's information about the connections that you can make. Uh, so this is the type of data that you receive back from a stun server. Signaling is just a means of communicating that connection info between those two peers or clients. Um, in our demo, we're going to be using a, an ASP.NET web server application using SignalR and WebSockets so that we can send information up and down to the server and to a specific client based on their connection ID. And of course, codecs. Uh, codecs 
graphics are the actual means of encoding and decoding information. So in for WebRTC, there, there's been kind of a push for a standard for a specific video and audio codec. And for video, that is VP8. And for audio, that is Opus. So having the same codec as a standard allows a client to receive data and know exactly how to uh, decode it in order to actually render either those audio buffers or the video frames on their client application. So are there any questions before we actually get into making those peer connections and how all of it actually works? Any confusion about those terms or anything? Right. Doesn't look like it yet. Cool. All right, let's talk about actually making some peer connections then. So there's, there is the two ways to do it, which is, uh, like I said, using just stun, uh, and then the other is using an actual turn server. So there's a nice little diagram here where you can see there are two peers on each side that want to connect to each other. So they're going to communicate through their NAT or through their firewall down to a stun server to get their information back and forth. When they get that information, they send it up to their signaling server up here. So that's where we have our little cloud diagram. And that signaling information is then sent back down to the other peer. So that would be things like letting them know that they actually want to connect. So peer one would say, hey, I want to connect to this person. And then they let peer two know that they want to connect to them. That could also be the actual ICE candidates that we talked about to say, here's the information that the stun server sent me on how to connect to me send that back down so that this peer can then actually make the connection. And then once that communication is established and the, both peers know that they can make a link to each other, they actually make that direct connection through their NAT type and then right over to the other peers, uh, which is where this little media stream is. So that's the actual peer connection. So, so it covers most scenarios. Um, like I said, the only other times you really need to uh, resort to turn is if you have heavy firewalls or incompatible NAT types or anything that, that might be odd. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a best practice to try to just use stun, avoid sending any information through a server, and then if it doesn't work, then you kind of fall back to, to making a request through the turn server. So looking at a diagram now for how to do it with both stun and turn, you can see it's very similar in the process of communicating over the NAT to the stun server, sending that up to the signaling server and back down. The difference is that that media link or that media stream that directly connects now goes up to the relay server and back down. That's really the only difference. So you're actually making a peer connection to the relay server. The relay server knows where to send it and it sends it back down to the other peer. So that's gonna cover just about every other case because the turn server can be agnostic to uh, other types of NATs um, to certain firewalls and it can try to kind of map any sort of weird connection it can figure out, um, which should cover almost every case. There right. are downsides to that. Um, sorry, go ahead. I was to say, we did have a question. What's the advantage of using a stun plus turn instead of using just stun? Yeah, so there, the only advantage is that um, certain connections cannot be made using just stun. So like I was saying, it's best to use just stun and if it fails, like if you have two different firewalls or incompatible NAT types, then fall back to using turn uh, for your actual connection. The downsides of using turn is that it can be expensive, uh, actually financially, because you have to maintain servers that actually handle processing streams. Uh, you have to deal with paying for bandwidth from those servers down to each of the peers. There's performance implications since you're no longer making a peer-to-peer -peer connection. But on the other end, it could actually have performance enhancements if, if say you're trying to connect two peers that are very drastically distant from each other it might actually be more performant to kind of find a turn server in between like geographically uh, so that those connections can be made there and then sent back down uh, that's not most of the cases uh, most of them the performance implications are negative for using turn uh, just because there's additional processing that has to be done and just having to have two different pipelines So next thing I want to talk about is actually connecting more than just two peers to each other. So doing, say, like a voice and video call is nice, but what's nicer is having three people or n number of people on the same call. 
So there's a few ways to actually handle this multi-connection. Uh, and this first one we're gonna talk about is the mesh model. So in the mesh model, each client creates a direct connection to each other client. Uh, like this diagram shows with these three different peers, peer one needs to connect to, to peer two and it needs to connect to peer three. So it looks fine when there's only three of them, but when you start to add uh, like, you know, 10 to 20 connections, each one of these peers needs to maintain a connection to all 19 other peers. So there are some problems with that, um, and it kind of limits you to the number of connections you can actually maintain. The first is that each one of these individual connections can drop without dropping all of the connections. So let's say peer one is connected to peer two and three. Let's see if we can see my mouse over here. Here we go. So peer one here on the left, peer two on top, and peer three on the right. It has a connection to both of them, but let's say peer one loses its connection to peer two it still maintains a connection to peer three. So peer three and peer one assume that they're, everything's working fine. And peer three and peer two assume that everything's working fine between them, but then there's this disconnect. So there's, there's a accountability in actually maintaining uh, the actual connections. Of, so you, you have to actually write defensive code around that. Uh, the other issue is the actual scalability of it. So these peer connections, because they're not running over any sort of processing server, rely on the actual CPU, GPU, and bandwidth of each peer individually. So one peer might have, uh, especially on something like a smartphone uh, in like a Xamarin Android application, that peer is not gonna have a ton of CPU power to handle processing 20 streams coming up and down. Uh, and especially not if they don't have a very good signal, if they're working over 3G or 4G connections. So that's kind of the, the, the two big downsides of this mesh model of connections, but it is sort of the standard of WebRTC because the idea is not to get processing servers involved to let the connection be handled and the, the information be handled by the actual client. The other is the mixer model. Um, so this is a common model used for these hugely scalable applications, including GoToWebinar and GoToMeeting, although they're, they're not written on WebRTC, they're written on proprietary platforms and frameworks. But the idea is that each peer makes a connection to a single server, and that server takes all of their audio and video streams and mixes them into one fat stream that's sent back down to each of the other people. Um, so that takes all of the processing off of the client. Each client no longer has to process 20 streams coming in for audio and 20 streams coming in for video. Instead, they can handle one big stream coming from the server and then their upstreams going to the server. So the downside to that is that it's, it's hard to scale out these servers because you have to have some sort of super server in order to handle processing hundreds of streams all at once and actually mixing them that becomes very CPU intensive for the server, but it takes it out of the hands of the client. Uh, the other issue is that it becomes expensive because you now have to maintain these new big servers in order to handle that heavy lifting. Um, but the upside to that, that it scales for the clients extremely well. Any other questions before we talk about what you can actually do with a peer connection? Let's move on then. So the first is of course sending audio and video data like we talked about. You make a call to get user media, you get access to their device hardware like their mic and their camera. You then encode the media using a codec. So you would encode using Opus for the audio and encode using VPA for the video. You then send that encoded media over the connection like we showed here with that big media stream. And then you can switch those media sources. So maybe you have that connection made for a video stream and then you switch where the actual source data is coming from. So maybe on your phone, you have a back camera and a front camera, you can switch between them or with a microphone. Uh, if you're on a desktop, for example, using a built-in one versus an external microphone and being able to switch between them. Some advanced functionality include uh, screen streaming. So actually sharing your desktop like you might do on Skype or like we're actually doing right now. Uh, multi-source streaming, which means streaming multiple audio streams from one client. So that could be streaming your desktop and streaming your video at the same time. 
and then streaming multiple audio streams, which is less of a, a common necessity with these types of applications we're talking about, since you don't really have two audio streams for one computer, but you could think of using this in sort of an actual TV broadcast where maybe you have two different microphones on the sides of a set, and both of those need to be sent and processed uh, to each of the actual receivers of the stream. Uh, audio mixing, like we talked about with that mixing model, uh, non-turn relaying, which means using a, a processing server, again, similar to that mixing model that uh, takes additional code in order to process streams. Um, it's hugely useful for the sort of uh, one-way broadcast because you can take in one stream and, and relay it to a number of people without having to maintain multiple connections. And that's what that distributed streaming is like. And then stream signatures um, is a more advanced topic of um, security so that you don't just use the regular VPA encoded data that might be able to be pulled off from, from any sort of really advanced software that can pull things off of your network. Instead, you have an actual signature built in on top of the encoded data that only your client knows about so that it can validate against the streams being received and sent. So, how do we take this set of tools and this set of frameworks built for web browsers and actually make it work on every single native platform? So some of the platforms that we'll be able to support is the web, uh, which is limited because certain browsers haven't built in the standards for WebRTC yet, including things like Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge. Um, some of them even have certain parts of the standards built and we'll actually kind of look at a model of what's supported in which browsers. For Windows, we have the WPF um, framework. We have Windows Forms, the old Windows 8RT and UWP. Uh, I know that UWP is possible, I just haven't built it yet. That's why there's an asterisk there. Uh, for Windows Phone, you can do the old 80 Silverlight and the 81 RT, which again, I haven't tested, but uh, in theory it should work that and they're kind of outdated and everything should be moving to UWP. And then of course, the important reasons we're talking about was Xamarin for Android, iOS, and Mac. And not just the actual native platforms, but in Xamarin for all three of those. So here's this kind of like grid. I know it's small, I have a bigger one up there uh, for the actual support of these different APIs uh, built into the standard for WebRTC. So you see there's the peer connection API. That's the stuff that actually handles making those connections from one peer to another like we talked about. So all of these browsers support it. Uh, Chrome Canary, Chrome, Opera, Nightly, I don't even know what that is. Firefox, the Android browser. Um, and then Edge is yellow because it supports ORTC, which is sort of becoming, a, it's an even newer standard built similarly to WebRTC. Um, and then Safari doesn't support any of this. Um, get user media, which actually allows you to get access to the hardware for their microphone and video. Support every, supported everywhere except for Safari again. Uh, data channels, which allows you to uh, flip the, the source for a given data channel. Supported by everything but Edge at this point, although um, in their documentation they talk about this uh, kind of being in, in the plans. And all of basically all these other APIs, we don't exactly need to go over every single one, uh, but the important ones are that VP8 is not supported in Edge because they're trying to push the H.264 video codec. Uh, the H.264 video codec is what gives you MP4 files, where the VP8 gives you WebM files, uh, if that helps make sense with these kind of acronyms and numbers tossed together. So, there's some workarounds for these web platforms or web browsers that don't support everything. Uh, you can build NPAPI plugins um, for Windows. You can build extensions for Chrome and Firefox and Opera. You could build ActiveX plugins, Java applets. But the issue is that it's still, it's still not gonna catch everything since Edge no longer has or doesn't have NPAPI plugin support. Uh, Java applets are limited and after the ActiveX plugins are not supported either. Um, so Edge is kind of the, the gray area where we can't work around it, where these other browsers still support NPAPI, they have their own extensions or they can support Java applets, um, which again, we can build because we can then access the native APIs for those codecs and making the actual 
um, connections through Stun and Turn. We can do that in a Java applet and plug it into our browser just fine, but Edge is not a fan of that. So outside of browsers, there is, of course, issues with each native platform. WebRTC is built as an open source C++ platform agnostic framework. So in theory, you should be able to use it everywhere. The biggest issue is that not every platform has the actual VP8 and Opus codex built into the operating system, um, including Windows. So VP8 is not native to the actual Windows SDKs for UWP or the old WinRT or even WPF and WinForms. So we have to actually take the C++ codex for VP8 and Opus and build a visual C++ library around it. Uh, so we can compile it against it and then we can reference it in each of those um, platform SDK projects. So unlike the web browsers that have those codecs built in, even for some of the other platforms, we have to explicitly pull them in and reference them. So some of the process for actually building against these different platforms, for Windows, we have to actually build out our VPA and Opus codecs in into those visual C++ libraries, and then we can reference them in our project. For Android, we need to bring in the library files, the SO files for VP8 and Opus. And then for iOS and Mac, it's basically the same thing. We need to bring in the official libraries. And then Xamarin, in order to get all these native libraries working, we have to build binding libraries around the codecs so that we can make reference calls to the native platforms. So, one of the big things that, that comes into play here that, that I very much have used in the past and that I support fully is this product uh, called Icelink. It, it's a library and framework that wraps not just the, the peer connections, but they also build a lot of tools that help with those codecs. Um, and they support just about every platform they can, like we talked about, other than Edge, uh, although they do push some things out there. So you can actually make an audio connection through WebRTC in Edge. Uh, but you won't be able to make a video connection. So that's kind of the only limitation of all these, but it supports native Android and native iOS, Xamarin Android and Xamarin iOS, Windows through WinForms, WPF, the old Windows 8 RT and Silverlight, plus the new UWP stuff, the old Windows Phone platforms. For web, it has an ActiveX control you can use. It has a Java app that you can use, and they're working on finishing an NPAPI plugin, which just performs better. Um, they also support native Mac um, and Xamarin Mac, plus just Java for the server side. So they have some cool things for building out your stun and turn servers uh, in .NET or in Java. And one thing I missed on here that they now support is also the tvOS natively and with Xamarin. So if anyone has any questions, now's a really good time to ask it. Um, if not, we're going to go look at some actual code in Visual Studio, and then we'll run a demo so we can actually see a voice and video connection being made between two platforms. Let's do it. All right. Hold on. Okay, I switched this to white theme. So in that link that I sent out, let me close all these out ahead of time. Ah, never mind, I'll leave it up. Okay. Let's open up a file so it's on the right side. Okay, so in that source code I sent the links out to in the start of the slide on my GitHub, we have here just the basic structure for a cross-platform application that's basically gonna touch on every platform. So we have an actual shared uh, PCL that's just gonna have some models and it's going to also handle the signaling through SignalR. We have a Xamarin Android project, a Xamarin iOS project, a Xamarin TV OS project, a UWP project, Windows 8 for or RT for Windows 8 and for Windows Phone, and WPF. Um, there are more platforms like I talked about um, for like Windows 8 Silverlight and stuff like that. Uh, I took those out just because they're even more gone than these three are. Then for our actual cloud side, we have a project for the actual signaling server. So that's that uh, ASP.NET project using SignalR that I talked about. And then we also have a stun and turn server that runs as a console app that you would load up on a virtual machine or something like that. 
And then down here, I have some of the, the code for the actual demo we're going to run, uh, just so because it, it's pre-built and we can spin it up without running into any problems. So we'll focus on, on building it out for Android since we only have about 30 minutes. So I have all the code in here, uh, but we can kind of step through the process of building an application that's going to use the WebRTC um, libraries and codecs and things like that without the headaches of, of actually finding the libraries and downloading them. I've kind of done that already. So you'll notice I actually have a component here for Icelink. Uh, there are, they are in the Xamarin component store. So the first thing you'd want to do is actually go install that. Uh, I saved us the time of watching it spin by doing it ahead of time. And then of course, you're also going to need some NuGet packages for JSON and for up here in our PCL for SignalR, which is also going to bring in Microsoft and HTTP and BCL build. So the first thing we're going to need to do in our shared code is build out our signaling service. So the signaling service needs to be able to send information up that, hey, we want to connect to a given conference room. Maybe it's by an ID, or in this case, we're just using a string name for it. And then it also needs to be able to send an offer answer and ICE candidates to a very specific person. So that, that person we want to connect to as our other peer. So the way we identify our other peer is by the string ID that we get from our SignalR connection. And then we can send information up to it through SignalR. And I'll pull up the hub, although it's probably going to throw errors because it's an old ASP.NET project and I'm in Visual Studio for Mac. So I'll uncomment these bits here so we can kind of look at exactly what's going on. So we have event handlers for when we have a new connection received, a new offer answer, and a new ICE candidate. So when we receive an offer answer or a candidate from another peer, we'll be able to take that and let our, uh, we'll let the IceLink SDK know or what's going on underneath is that we're going to take that ID and then start sending our offer answers and candidates back over to them. And then down here, we'll have the actual events to invoke those event handlers. And then these three methods right here are our way of saying, I want to join this conference room. I want to send an offer answer to a specific peer and I want to send an ICE candidate to a specific peer. So what these look like, um, let's say the offer answer, these are just going to send over JSON strings because they have uh, basically what an ICE candidate looks like is a, a big uh, encoded string of information that says, I can connect over this, this port with these types of streams for audio, for video, for files. Um, and things like that. So it's easier for us to wrap that into a JSON object and send that up through SignalR. That way it can be agnostic to each of the platforms and we can kind of skip go back if we need to. So we have our ability to send information up and receive information about our connections. The next thing we need is to be able to use those. So let's go build out our page for our actual call. So really the only thing we need here is a, a big view that fills it that can, well, I don't know why it comments it again. We need a view to fill the page that we can start injecting the individual video controls into. So we need to show our own video. We need to show the first person that connects their video. And then we also need to be able to show each individual person that connects after that and kind of manipulate the layout. Um, Icelink has some tools for us to do that. So all we need to do is actually give it a video container. Um, in this case, we have a relative layout uh, in Android that's going to fill the width and height of our entire view. And then down here, we have some buttons that will give us the ability to mute our audio and video. So now that we have our layout, and I'm not sure why it keeps moving my solution, explore over here. We can set up our actual activity for the conference. So we set our content view to that call layout we just created. And then we got to instantiate our controls. So let's get our video container and our buttons instantiated. And then we'll wait to uncomment these until we actually build out our 
conference service. So our conference service does a lot. Uh, it manages the actual connections. It, it does registering the codec. So I wanted to kind of break this down so that we have our individual regions here for things to look at. And I don't know why they auto expanded. Okay. So the first thing we have are all our fields that we're going to need in order to actually manage this conference. So that's going to include the actual URL for our stun and turn servers. Um, in this case, they exist on the same server. Um, you can use a different server for stun and a different server for turn. Uh, but in this case, it's actually much easier to just have them exist in the same place. And we have a reference to our signaling service that we just created so that we can send offer answers and connection information up and down. We have the name of the actual conference room we want to join. We have a reference to our local media stream. Uh, this is an IceLink object that contains information about our audio and our video streams. We have a reference to the conference object itself. This is another IceLink object or model that kind of contains the whole mesh connection model that we talked about before. So it, it handles keeping a reference to each of the peers we're connected to, the states of that connection and things like that. We then have a layout manager, which is going to handle manipulating our view for when a new video is added or when a person leaves, removing that video and kind of resetting the layout. Uh, this is also uh, brought to us by IceLink. And then we have a view for our local video control. And then this Opus echo canceller is just uh, an additional thing that I've added in here uh, to handle some echo cancellation using some of the Opus APIs that we can get access to uh, in Android. So now in our constructor, what we can do is set up our signaling service, and then we're going to want to wire up those event handlers we created for when we receive a new connection, when we receive a new offer answer, and when we receive a new candidate. And then after that, we also want to register our codec so that we know before we go talk to stun or turn, hey, we're going to use Opus and hey, we're going to use VP8. Uh, because you don't have to use these two codecs. They're part of the WebRTC standard. But with the tools Icelink builds you, or if you're building them out yourself, you can use any codec you want uh, in order to encode and decode each of your streams. Um, so in this case, we want to be able to tell, oops, we want to be able to tell the stun server and our peer which codecs we're using. So what we're going to do down here is actually register those uh, through the Icelink SDK. So we instantiate a VPA codec. We instantiate an Opus codec. Uh, these are created by uh, making Xamarin bindings to the native libraries we imported. So we have a couple of questions here, Alex. Um, first of all, did you try open TOK? Um, well, what's open talk. Between, yeah, open talk. Sorry. Uh, and what's the difference with ice ice link? Yeah. So open talk's more expensive, um, and they also don't build out as many tools for the other Xamarin uh, platforms. The other thing that open talk does do better than ice link is that they do have an NPAPI plugin uh, for Safari and for uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, but yeah. Basically, open talk um, is expensive. That and uh, I've just used IceLink before they even, before OpenTalk even introduced some of their SDKs. So it's something I'm more comfortable with when I actually develop. But in either way, uh, whatever you can do to actually get to those native APIs, it, it shouldn't really matter in the end. Uh, I just like IceLink's tooling better. Okay. And kind of a, maybe a follow up on that when we're talking about pricing is uh, does using the local IceLink SDKs mean that we, should or need to use their paid service? So um, I, they changed it a while ago, but if I remember correctly, the difference between the free Icelink Community Edition is that it doesn't give you, uh, or it ha I think it has a restriction on a time that you can use the um, the turn connections. So if you're doing like a like a WLAN connection uh, or through like a 4G connection then you might be restricted to a certain amount of time before it, it auto kills the connection. Uh, there's a workaround to actually just continuously keep connecting, um, but obviously that's something you have to build to it. But their enterprise tooling uh, gets much better. They have more in-depth examples. They have amazing support 
Um, I know I sound like I'm trying to sell people on it, but I, I've really enjoyed working with Anton at Frozen Mountain uh, to fix some of the initial problems when they were first releasing their Xamarin SDKs. And yeah, you don't have to use the Enterprise one, but it does come with a lot of better tools uh, and, and the support is great. Thanks. There any other questions? Uh, nope, that's it. So just a question about, um, can you leave us some links about the Xamarin SDKs and things like that? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll, uh, make, make, I'll, make available. Yeah. So they, they were in, um, the, the resources that were made of that are going to be made available in that second slide that that's part of the deck. Uh, so you'll be able to go to Icelink's documentation from there and then you can get the Xamarin SDKs. Otherwise, you can actually go to the Xamarin Component Store and just look up Icelink uh, and download it from there. Okay, so we left off with getting our codec set up and sort of our processing um, for the encoding and decoding. So we registered our VP8 and Opus codecs as the codecs we're going to use to tell the Stun server and to tell our peers. And then we also uh, initialize our Java libraries. It's kind of using the old way of loading uh, bindings. Uh, because it's using actual SO libraries and not uh, jars or, or Android uh, resources. So it's in order to get a full binding library for Android, uh, you'd have to take these libraries, put it into an actual Java library, build a jar around that, and then get the binding. So in order to skip that headache, we just kind of load it directly by calling the Java system load library. And because they are referenced here in our lib folder under each of the build types. So like by 86, for example, we have our Opus and VPA um, built libraries. We can just call the load library here and it will pull it in as a reference. So we've registered our codecs. We've set up for um, our signaling service, although we haven't fully uncommented our, our endpoints for receiving, uh, which we'll do right now. So when we receive a new candidate or a new offer answer uh, or a new peer, we want to tell the conference, uh, for example, let's let's break it down to our first peer. Someone says, hey, I want to connect to this room. We send it down to everybody who's in the room. And then when we receive that person's request to join, we need to tell the conference, hey, start doing what we need to do to connect to this person, which would be generating an offer answer for them and then sending that back over. And so then on the other side with our receive offer answer, we need to tell the conference object from Icelink that we're receiving a new one. Uh, so we deserialize that into the full object offer answer. Um, and then we register that as, hey, it's coming from this person so that our conference knows, all right, we have an offer answer for this person. Let's start sending them candidates to connect to us. Again, on the other side, for receiving a candidate, we do basically what we did for the offer answer, and we tell the conference we received a candidate. So the magic that happens behind the scene is that the Icelink SDK will take each candidate, and then it will uh, talk to the native WebRTC APIs and say, hey, this candidate works for us. Let's go connect to them through these means, uh, through that encoded string with the port information and the stream type information. The next thing we need to do is actually kick it off. So when we start our conferencing service, we're going to register the name of the room we want to connect to. We need to start our connection to SignalR, and then we need to make that call to get user media. So we need to get access to the camera and microphone and then actually build the conference object and things like that. And then after we've done that successfully, then we can tell the signaling service, I want to join this room and tell everybody who's already there that we're joining. So down here is this big fat call to get user media. I'll break it down in just a sec. I just want to get it all the way uncommented. So the get user media has a few steps uh, and it kind of looks weird just based on the way that uh, Iceland kind of built their SDK around user media. So the first thing we do is set the Icelink default provider uh, Android context to the context that we're passing in. So that's going to end up being the activity where all of this is happening. From there, we make a call to actually get media. So that's this true and true here saying we want audio and we want video. 
we set our, our preview scale and our video scaling to contain them within the video container. You can set these to a few different options, um, such as cover or stretch, so you can actually uh, fill out more of the area. Whoa, I don't know why I got that autocomplete there. Okay, thank you, Visual Studio. Anyway, we'll just leave it. Uh, you can then set the video width and height for what you're going to actually send. So this is another piece that we need to let the stun server know so that we know, hey, this stream that's coming through is going to be 640 by 480, and we're going to try to push for sending 15 frames per second on our video. And we have two callbacks for on success and on failure. If we succeed, we have this result type that contains a ton of information about the actual local media that we acquire. So we set that local media to our local stream of audio and video so that we can have a reference to it from outside of this method. Uh, this will allow us to do things like mute our video, change the video source, uh, pick up different audio level detections. So we can say, um, oh, show this view because we know we are talking based on our local stream's audio detection. We then set the layout manager to a new IceLink Android layout manager and we pass in the actual view where the videos are going to be contained, um, which in our case is that one we created in our layout file. We then set our local video control cast to a view since this is just going to be an object. So then we have a reference to the view itself where our video preview will live. Then we create our actual stream object. So we create a local video stream based on the local stream that we get from our get user media. And then we instantiate our conference using a new audio stream from it and our local video stream. Um, I instantiate the local video stream outside because there's a few event handlers we need to add here uh, for adding new videos as they come in. We then use a, a relay username and password. Uh, this is in order to use the turn server that's provided by IceLink. We also have to set a DTLS certificate, which is uh, another means of security uh, and, and tells the stun server that we're not some person outside of our scope. And then we set up our event handlers for when we need to send a candidate or when we need to send an offer answer. So the conference object from IceLink is going to say, we've generated an offer answer and then our code can handle what to do with it. In that case, it's going to send it up through SignalR and back down to the given peer. We also have two event handlers here for the local video stream for on link init and on link down. These events are for when someone else's video is going to initialize in our container and someone else's video has lost its stream, whether they've left the conference or something has crashed or something like that. So we can create an event handler to actually add the video control and to um, remove it when something goes down. And then we tell our layout manager to add our local video control. And then this is again, just a nice piece for the, the echo canceller. Then the last bit down here is the actual event handlers we wired up up there. So you can see that we have when our local video stream detects that someone went down, we check with the layout manager and we remove their video control by their peer ID. And the opposite for init, we cast it to a view and we add it to the video control. Uh, we add the video control to the layout manager. And then for when the conference receives a new offer answer to send people, we'll call to our signaling service to send it, and then the same thing for the ICE candidate. And then that's basically everything we need in order to actually maintain a conference call. The last bit is to go back to our activity and actually kick it off when it's created. Oops, I think I missed uncommenting something in here. Yeah, I missed a region. This is just those, those uh, mutes muting video, muting audio, and switching the audio device or video device like we talked about. So that's all that you really need in order to set up a full-blown multi-user connection. Uh, this does use the mesh connection like we talked about. We're not doing any audio mixing or anything like that. And what I can do now is actually run it for you. Uh, I'm gonna be running a more robust example since I know that it's going to work. Um, so what I can do is switch over here. And I have another computer running on the side over here that I can actually connect through their browser doing a screen share. So we're gonna connect on 
this Android phone, which screen you should be seeing. And then we're going to join a conference where I've already connected on a PC with a screen share. So you should actually see Zanko Studio um, when we join in here, plus myself. Hello. Hi, Alex. We can see you. Yeah. So I'm on an Android phone right now talking to a browser over here. And I can actually leave from the browser and connect with my video. There we go. How about that? Very cool. So does anyone have any other questions or want to see more of my face? <laughs> well, those are two separate questions. <laughs> Uh, no, no other questions here. I think uh, it's going to take a lot of going through the source code and things like that. Yeah, so. yeah. There is a lot of there is a lot of source here. Um, I do want to point out that I have not finished building out some of these other platforms, the Windows platforms. Uh, I'll be doing that in the next few months when I have some free time. But everything else is up there. Uh, these demos here from IceLink are actually fully runnable on iOS, and they even have the actual binding libraries built out here. Um, since we get a reference to an actual A file for iOS, we can build a Xamarin bindings library around it the proper way instead of that kind of dirty way that we do with these load libraries in Android. Um, I would show you the iOS, but my phone bricked this morning when I was trying to run something else on it, and it doesn't work on a simulator because you don't have a camera so or a microphone. Okay, but if we were yeah, to so run the if we were to run that iOS, it should work on our. It device. does. It does run. It just doesn't right. work. So I, yeah, I mean, I can run it over here, and you'll see it. It builds and runs just fine. Right. You just won't be able to actually make the connection. I can pull it over here. And as you update the code over the next couple of months, is it going to continue to stay in that same GitHub repo? Yeah, it's it's all going to be right there. Yeah, it's going to be in. I'll, I'll pull up the link again here. We go back to these resources. But yeah, you can see the simulators running it, but it won't be able to actually join anything. Let me pull up these resources and put the slideshow back up. So the finished source, the, the source we're actually pulling from is at my GitHub, which is github.com slash swap pirate, no underscore in this case, slash xamarin.webrtc. Um, and here's again a, a link to the documentation on IceLink, uh, which is by frozenmountain.com. But that's all I've got for today. Um, you can always, of course, hit me up on Twitter, which is suave underscore pirate, uh, or go to my blog. I'll be talking about this a little more over the next few months uh, there. And we can kind of break down some of the components, uh, look outside of Icelink, look at other frameworks like OpenTalk or just building our own uh, using those native platforms. Great, and if anybody hasn't gone to Alex's blog, I definitely suggest it. You've got lots of great uh, content up there. I always look forward to your blog Thank posts. You. So lots of cool yeah, things I, going on. I try to try to write something new every every day or two. So it, there's always new stuff coming through with some weird things that you might run into with Xamarin. Right. Um, so one question, are you using this in a production app? So we are, uh, I can't speak to a specific client, but we are going to be working on Building it out, I have in the past uh, with my startup I ran called Centel, uh, but that has since been taken down. Um, but I know that IceLink itself has been used in a few production apps, and they have a portfolio up on their website uh, that you can see some of the applications using it. All right, great. And then uh, one more question. So. Um, turn.icelink.fm port 3478. The stun turn server requires some subscription. And you can see that in the questions if it helps to read it. Well, let, me, let me pull that up. So the code for building a turn server uh, is, is part of the enterprise one. Wait, oh no, does it require a subscription? No, this is actually the, the turn.icing.fm at port 3478. Um, that's open. That's what their actual demos use. So I'm going to, I can reply here to um, that the demo site that I was on on this other computer is actually built by Icelink. So that's demo.icelink. 
.fm. Um, and they are using, oh, it's not even letting me send it. Here, I'll put that up there. That is using that same stun and turn server. Um, so also when you pull down the component, I can pull it up real quick. Oh wait, no, cancel. I just wanna cancel this. When you pull up the component, I can show you here. They send you, they have samples in here, which is where these demos are actually taken from. Uh, and these demos for Android, iOS, and um, Mac are also using that same stun and turn server. If you want to build your own stun and turn server, like the code we have here, that's where the restrictions come in. You can download the source from the community edition for the stun and turn. Um, but this will have restraints on length of time with certain app types, if I remember correctly. They might have changed it um, since I haven't pulled down their enterprise license in a few months now. Thank <music> you.